Hi everyone, um, I know it's a little late in the evening and this is an extremely tempting section in the corner. Uh, thank you IDAC for uh, uh, inviting me here but I have to confess I had another vested interest to come to Indore, it was the food. So um, talking about ground realities, uh, I'm going to get into it a little later through the presentation in terms of what I really mean by it. Um, other than food, one of the other things that I'm extremely preoccupied with is this idea of the ground, you know. Um, and going back uh, to the 60s and the 70s, this idea of land art or earth art is something that's always fascinated me for a couple of reasons. One, you know, um, even today we were talk talking about activism at various levels and what a bunch of artists did in the 60s and the 70s was that they wanted to break the hegemony of art that happens through museums or the idea of art being in, in uh, sort of captivated in architecture in the form of a museum or, or the fact that it was uh, highly commercial. So artists during that time like the Smithsons uh, really said that we would start creating art on nature you know, where you have these blank canvases and we'll stop looking at the ground as a two-dimensional surface on which you project something but really looked at it as something that is layered and nuanced that you can actually play with to create various experiences. So this immersive idea of what the ground uh, sort of provides is something that uh, has always uh, excited me. This idea of architecture and, and, and the correlation to ground is not just something that I think I have been uh, thinking about. Um, I think Frank Lloyd Wright's receding hairline, uh, Mises' affinity to the cigarette or, or Courbusier getting his glasses was all because of this preoccupation of what to do with the ground. And what I mean by that is if you look at three projects and there are little sections below like diagrams, for Frank Lloyd Wright, the architecture was always an extrusion of the ground, which means his buildings were really extrusions of nature in terms of how it would get infused with the ground. It was almost like the ground kind of forms his buildings and then these cantilevered slabs come out of it. For Mies, it was about hovering about the ground. So it would just levitate almost magically in an extremely light way and had a very sort of delicate kind of attachment to the ground. And and thereby, you know, had a very sort of intimate relationship with the ground. For Cobb, it was extremely political. For Corbusier, it was the World War. The ground, you know, the, the grounds for his architecture were very different. The ground was replete with, with, it was politically charged. So his idea of architecture was to liberate the architecture from this ground. So he completely detaches the ground and then the ribbon window comes, which is a very democratic way of looking at what architecture needs to be. So we at Cadence also have our own preoccupation with the ground. Um, we've been thinking about what the relationship of architecture and the ground needs to be. We were told that this is a forum where we shouldn't show our work. So I'm going to keep it more issue based, but I'll use work of other architects to do this. But these are some diagrams from our office that talk about how buildings are sited and what we do with the idea of the ground. So we look at three conditions. One is buildings in landscape. The second one is landscape in buildings. And the third one is building landscapes. So the first uh, um, idea uh, about buildings in landscape is really about how buildings are sited in landscape. Now there are two ways of looking at it. There's a school of thought that likes to respect nature and then you have something almost like background music that kind of is subservient to the nature and sort of, it sort of melts in it or hides in nature. Then there are other projects that are really stake a claim for architecture and, they're, and they want to be pronounced expressions in landscape, maybe kind of inspired by landscape. So an example of that is this project by So Fujimoto. It's uh, the School of Music in Hungary. It is just getting completed. And I thought it was a great example of a project that stakes a claim for architecture. I think another word that was floating around this evening was this idea of the footprint and I'd like to sort of bring your attention to this idea of a footprint which is extremely light in terms of what it occupies. The idea of the building really is to work with the silhouettes of the trees and it gets shaped. There's this large parasol which then becomes a filter for sunlight, almost redefining what sunlight needs to be. The roof is obviously inspired by 
you know, the foliage of the trees and how the light sort of comes through it, but it does something else to it. And of course, the columns, in an, in an extremely banal way, mimic the trunks, but then they do the job in holding up this parasol. The architecture also, which is the, uh, in terms of the plan, is, is driven by, uh, you know, glass, you know, blocks that kind of keep the whole terrain extremely transparent. So, what's exciting for me with this idea of architecture in landscape with this project, it has to do with the fact that there is creation of new ground, then there is this idea of uh, uh, an object sitting on it, and then there is a redefinition of the sky itself. So it's an extremely important uh, uh, gesture in that sense, which completely respects nature but redefines it in its own way. Uh, the next relationship is this idea of landscape in buildings. And when I look at the idea of landscape in buildings, I look at the idea of empathy, you know, uh, the idea of intimacy. And when you have these moments of landscape in buildings, they give rise to these situations where it evokes empathy and evokes that sense of in intimacy. So for this, I'm looking at a project in Japan uh, by an architect called Nendo, uh, uh, a firm called Nendo. And it's an interesting project where there are three levels which are occupied by three generations in the same family. And there is this diagonal strip in the form of a staircase that houses landscape that penetrates through the house, connects the three levels, and really becomes this device that connects the family. So notice that there's a large tree in front. There's a huge foreground left. So there is intimacy to the existing nature, and there is also intimacy towards nature that's brought in. You know, And what is also interesting is how the building sort of extends out and then goes beyond and connects to the city. So there is intimacy at various levels, and landscape becomes a very important, uh, important proponent in that. Um, the last uh, part that I want to talk about is this idea of building landscape or this idea of constructed landscape. And like I mentioned before, for me, the ground is not just two-dimensional. The ground is a layer that one can occupy. It's a layer that one can peel with. So in a certain sense, it's extremely layered. And a good example of that is um, this little island project by the Heatherwick studio. And uh, Thomas Heatherwick has done this in New York. And he's questioned this idea of what a pier needs to be. So a typical pier has vertical posts with a horizontal platform on it. But then he said, what happens if we look at this almost like a piece of fabric? And then this piece of fabric is then grafted onto the water, almost. So it's like you recreate land, but then what you do with it is that you give it an underbelly. And when you give it an underbelly, you get in light for the marine life below. So these thousands of pots that give this undulation then really become a commentary on the city of New York. Because the city of New York has Central Park, but the city of New York is flat. So this piece of, I don't know what you call it, landscape, architecture, maybe both, maybe neither, maybe all of it, maybe this piece of sculpture, really questions that and creates this topography which is extremely varied and that is missing in the city of New York. And I think it's an extremely powerful gesture because it then becomes this cohesive whole that brings architecture, landscape, and people and public life together and becomes an important fabric of the city that is grafted onto the water. Thank you so much.